reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. The next day, John the Baptist was by the Jordan again with two of his disciples. Seeing Jesus walk by, John the Baptist said, Look, there's the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what John said and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned round and noticed these disciples following, he asked them, What are you seeking? They replied, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come and see, Jesus answered. So they went to where Jesus was staying, and they spent the day with Jesus. It was about four in the afternoon. One of the two who had followed Jesus after hearing John the Baptist was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The first thing Andrew did was to find Simon Peter and say, we have found the Messiah, the Anointed One. Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, who looked hard at him and said, you are Simon, the God of Jonah. I will call you Peter, meaning rock. The good news of salvation. Tonight, we read from the Gospel of John, pondering this story of the calling and naming of Peter as the rock. The lectionary's compilers dovetailed this story of Peter's naming as the rock with a somewhat obscure story from the Hebrew Bible, and that is uh, Samuel as a young boy, sleeping next to the Ark of the Covenant, hearing an unfamiliar voice call out to him. But Samuel doesn't realize that that voice is God until the third time. And then we've got a little snippet uh, from chapter 6 of Paul's letter to Corinth, where Paul begs us as Christians to not be distracted from our call by indulging in gluttony and lust, sins of the body, as he puts it. And tonight, we also commemorate the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, as is our tradition, Daniel Velasquez will be reading from the I Have a Dream speech after communion. What I want to do is to draw out a lesser chapter of Dr. King's biography tonight. Um, and that's the moment when he heard and honored his call to become a preacher and activist. As we reflect on these different stories of calling, there's an opportunity for each of us to wrestle with these questions. What is God calling us to do? Are we heeding that call? Are we taking action and getting to work? Or 
Are we wasting time? If we dig into the readings a bit, we find some unexpected gems to help answer these questions. So let's start with Peter, his naming, and the way John tells the story in the fourth gospel. Now, as we all know, John's gospel opens with that famous prologue, in the beginning was the Logos. That's another homily. <laughs> After the prologue, John pivots to the desert, where we meet John the Baptist, humbly telling his followers that a Messiah far greater than him is coming. Then we cut to the next scene. Jesus appears before John the Baptist and two of John the Baptist's followers. And John tells Andrew and an unnamed disciple, that's the man, that's the Messiah, that's the Lamb of God. And Andrew and that other chap whose name you will never know, well, they decide to go for it. They leave the circle of John the Baptist and they cast their lot to follow Jesus. So Jesus turns around and notices Andrew and the other disciple literally following him down as he walks along the road. And he asks them somewhat existentially, what do you seek? Now, as is often the case in the Gospel of John, Jesus asks a question and the disciples don't really understand what Jesus is trying to get at. So, instead of answering Jesus with some kind of high-minded philosophical reflection, Andrew responds more pragmatically. Where are you singing tonight? <laughs> in other words, we're simply seeking you, Jesus. We want to hang out. And Jesus says, okay, come and find out what I'm about. Because honestly, Andrew doesn't really know what he's seeking. What he did know is that John the Baptist said this man is the Messiah. So he just decided to follow Jesus and let the chips fall where they may. And, you know, I think we have something to learn from Andrew tonight. Because sometimes heeding the call from God, there's a bit of reckless uncertainty to it. Look before you leap. Did you know that adage goes back to 1350? <laughs> but sometimes, especially when God calls, we can't look before we leap. Instead, we take a leap of faith, like Andrew. Andrew then finds his brother, Simon. Andrew was so excited and tells Simon, that he has become acquainted with the Messiah, and that Simon has got to meet Jesus for himself. So Andrew brings Simon to Jesus. And in a very laconic and matter-of-fact way, Jesus informs Simon that his new name is Peter, which is basically the nickname Rocky in Greek. <laughs> now, this point is not normally made because Sylvester Stallone as the Italian-American underdog boxer is now inseparable from Rocky. But Peter was, in fact, the first Rocky. How about that? <laughs> now, John's Gospel doesn't give us a glimpse here into what Peter is thinking when he gets Rocky as his new nickname. But, of course, we, the informed readers of John's Gospel, well... We can't find but help, but we can't help it. We, we probably find this name Rocky a bit ironic because Peter doesn't really turn out to be a stable rock in the story that follows, does he? <laughs> Peter misunderstands Jesus' point in several of the dialogues that follow. Peter gets overly emotional at one point and cuts off a poor man's ear, despite Jesus' call to nonviolence. Oh, and let's not forget that during the Passion, P 
Peter infamously denies Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And to add insult to injury, Peter isn't even the first to see the risen Christ. No, Mary Magdalene got there first. So what is the purpose here of naming Simon the Rock when his behavior, if you'll forgive the bad pun, is so unrocky? Peter, like me and like you, was merely human. And let's face it, we all might have a bit more in common with Peter, with Rocky, than we would care to admit. <laughs> Haven't we all misunderstood God's teachings too? Haven't we all denied God in our own way? Haven't we all cracked under pressure? Peter was strong and rock-like, not because he lacked all too human flaws. Peter was a rock because he did not give up. In spite of his flaws and his foibles and his mistakes, Peter kept going. Winston Churchill once quipped that success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> All of us stumble, Churchill and Peter alike. But we can't use this all too human stumbling as an excuse. What we can learn from Peter tonight is that being a rock isn't about some impossible call to be perfect. It's about dusting ourselves off after we mess up and going right back out there again. Let's now quickly talk about Samuel. Tonight's reading from the Hebrew Bible, which James read very well, takes place at a very early moment in Jewish history, long before King Solomon built that glorious first temple. The young Samuel is in a humble tent with the sacred Ark of the Covenant. That special container held the stone tablets upon which the Ten Commandments were inscribed, as well as Aaron's magical staff and a jar of manna. At this point, Samuel is a young boy but he showed a special spiritual talent. So the priest Eli took him under his wing and gave him the very unique honor of being allowed to sleep in the tent next to the ark. Yahweh calls out to Samuel, but Samuel has never heard the voice of God. So he doesn't realize it's God. The young boy, Listening to his common sense, assumes it must have been Eli calling him. So he goes out from the tent and says, Eli, here I am. But Eli, annoyed and irritated, says, Samuel, I didn't call you. Go back in the tent. So Eli goes back in the tent, heads back next to sleep to the vestiges of the Ten Commandments. But once again, God calls Samuel a second time. Samuel once again misperceives God's voice as Eli's voice and rushes out of the tent to his mentor. And for a second time, Eli says, it wasn't me, kid. Go back to sleep. Of course, the third time is a charm, right? Eli realizes that it is God speaking to the young Samuel. So he instructs Samuel to respond, speak Yahweh, for your servant is listening. Samuel dutifully responds this way, but ugh, again, the narrative cuts out at this point, so we don't learn how Samuel feels about that or what happens next. But what we are meant to learn from this little slapstick story in the book of Samuel is that sometimes 
It's hard to hear God's voice the first time. But God keeps calling us until we do hear it. And that was certainly the way it worked for Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Here's a fun little fact. Back in 1959, a woman by the name of Joan Thatcher, I don't expect you to know her, she was then the publicity director of the American Baptist Convention, and she wrote to Dr. King asking him to share a bit about his call. Joan Thatcher was concerned because as she explained in her letter to Dr. King, and I quote, Apparently, many of our young people still feel that unless they see a burning bush or a blinding light on the road to Damascus, they haven't been called. I think we can all relate to that. Mm -hmm. Here is Dr. King's response that he sent back to Miss Thatcher. And I quote from Dr. King's letter. My call to the ministry was neither dramatic nor spectacular. It came neither by some miraculous vision nor by some blinding light experience on the road of life. Moreover, it did not come upon me as a sudden realization. Rather, it was a response to an inner urge that gradually came upon me. This urge expressed itself in a desire to serve God and humanity and the feeling that my talent and my commitment could best be expressed through the ministry. At first, I planned to be a physician. Then I turned my attention in the direction of the law. But as I passed through the preparation stages of these two professions, I still felt within that undying urge to serve God and humanity through the ministry. During my senior year in college, I finally decided to accept the challenge to enter the ministry. I came to see that God had placed a responsibility upon my shoulders, and the more I tried to escape it, the more frustrated I would become. A few months after preaching my first sermon, I entered theological seminary. This, in brief, is an account of my call and pilgrimage to the ministry. Dr. King was a truly remarkable man, but there is nothing spectacular about the story of his call. So instead of waiting for the clouds to part, how can we better listen to that inner urge that we keep feeling? And how can we get to work with the same tenacity as Dr. King. May we all have the strength to hear that voice like Samuel, and may we all have the strength to not give up like Peter. Amen. Amen.